Matthew chapter 24 is where we have been for a while. And actually last week, we really didn't do much of Matthew chapter 24. Got it. All right. We backed up. We had gotten, I, I believe, as far as verse 28 a couple of weeks ago. But we kind of backed up and looked at some other things that are going to happen before this time that Jesus is talking about. Before that seven years of tribulation time. Because the week before that we had co covered verse 15 and the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So we went back and we looked at the prophecies of Daniel. And then, so I wanted to go spend some time in Ezekiel last week, which we did. And we, we looked at the, the rebirth of Israel in uh, Isaiah 36 and 37. And we, and, and we hit them very in-depth, obviously, because we covered four chapters, which is not something that usually happens. Well, really, only three. And I encourage you to read 39 by yourself uh, just because we ran out of time. But uh, So we went through, skimmed through. Ezekiel 36 and 37 and and then Ezekiel 38 and mentioned 39 a little bit but if you went back and you read you find out that Israel doesn't even defend itself in this this coming attack from the north and we talked about all the different players uh, by their ancient name and by their modern name so that we know that this is Russia and this is Iran and this is Turkey the three main players plus some of the other uh, nations from North Africa, um, Central Asia, and, and that, that are going to be a, a part of all of that, that the other nations that have been enemies of Israel for quite a long time uh, are becoming more friendly toward Israel, and now we're just kind of in a place to, to complain about what is Russia doing? Why, why are you coming down? Are you just coming to take a spoil? And I've told you that if you've listened to some of the interviews with Netanyahu, some of the other world leaders, you find that um, some of the very words that are being used in the Bible to describe this time are, being, are coming out of the mouths of people who likely don't even believe. Maybe have never even read any of this stuff. Um, but certainly certainly not, not believers in Jesus. And, and yet... Some of the very words that are written in the Bible are coming out of their mouths. You'll hear something very often, one phrase, peace and safety. The Bible tells us when they say peace and safety or peace and security, that sudden destruction comes upon them. <clears throat> There's a page, if you can go to the United Nations page, web page, there is a page that is titled peace and security right on it. It's pretty amazing. So... We're going to try to move forward a little bit today. Because I could go back and, and, and I, obviously I don't feel like I hit it very hard. Uh, but, but we could go back and, and do that some more. But we're going to, we're going to try to move forward because we're staying in this time frame. We're not going to be done with the end times. Jesus takes quite a long time here to go through this and explain and re-explain. And then use parables to explain. To his disciples. This is what they call the Olivet Discourse. This is recorded in Matthew and Mark and Luke. This is not recorded in John. Because most Bible teachers at least that I listen to. If not the scholars believe that John was actually written to the church. While these other three were written to specific areas. But they were written more so to, to establish who Jesus was. And, and, uh, and, and they each establish him in his in a different way um, Matthew is the the lion of the tribe of Judah the king the Messiah very messianic Mark as a suffering servant uh, Luke as as a man he focuses a great deal on Jesus humanity and John focuses on him as God his deity uh, John however records something the other three don't and that is another discourse that takes place from the upper room in the Last Supper to his arrest in the in the garden where he's speaking directly to the 12 and it's actually more something that applies more directly to the church this a lot of what we're going over now applies to israel this is very jewish in nature in the explanation not all of it but most of it applies to israel so and that's so that's why we were focusing on ezekiel 38 and 39 the establishment of the nation in 37 or 36 and 37 
So we're going to try to get the timeline back here uh, as far as what we've done. So I want to start with verse 16 because if I go to 15, well, let's, let's start with verse 17. Because if I go to 15, I'm going to get back in Daniel and I don't want to do that. All right. So let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And this is about the, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And we pretty much, I feel like anyways, establish that that is the Antichrist three and a half years midway into the tribulation, going into the temple and showing himself to be, or claiming himself to be God of every above all other gods all right so when you see this happen it says uh, let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house let and let him who is uh, in the field not go back to get his clothes but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the sabbath for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, never, nor uh, ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say uh, to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not, be, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For whoever, or for wherever uh, the carcass is, there the eagles will gather together. All right, so... He gives warning when you see this. Uh, when you see this abomination, when you see this man stand in the temple and claim to be God, it's time to flee. And this is to Israel. This is to Judah. And, and they're to flee to the mountains. They're not to go back and take their, you know, gather clothes. They're not to go down off the rooftop and, and get their stuff. Just take off right now and pray. And this is why I say this is especially to Israel, because it says, pray that your, your flight might not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Because the Orthodox Jews would have only a certain amount of distance that they would be able to cover. If they're going to stay undefiled in their own mind to keep the Sabbath. That's going to be a worry for them. It wouldn't be a worry for us. We go as far as we want to on a Sabbath day. We go too far on a Sabbath day. I mean, we don't take very many days of rest. We, we need to do that. It, it's created for us, not us for it. We're not supposed to worship the day, obviously. And we've gotten into all that teaching before, but we're to, we are to rest. We need to rest. And, and it's not just, you know, sleep it off. It's not, um, you know, recover from party time. And so that's what it is. It's not jump in the boat and go out and... I mean, you certainly you can do all that stuff, but it's really meant as a time to, to imitate what God did on the seventh day, and that is to spend time with his creation. And so that day is to spend time with our creator. It's to be focused on him. It's to be listening for him. It's to set aside the busyness of the week and focus on him. So Jesus says here, man, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Because religion is, is religion ties us up. And we, we have a hard time getting away from a religion and getting to our, our Savior. And getting to, to real safety. He talks about great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. So that's seven, that seven years that is very well described or very much described in Revelation. That seven year time period is worse than any other time that's ever been in, the, in this world. And that three and a half years, the second three and a half years is going to be even worse. Because now this person has declared himself to be God. That's going to ramp up what he wants to do 
and how he wants to control and what he wants to put on the, the population of the entire world, what his demands are going to be of the nations that are around. But it also, when we go into Revelation, ramps up the judgment of God being poured out on the earth. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. And, and when we read through Revelation, we find out they don't repent. These things happen and they still don't repent. The, the, there will be, obviously, the Jews who are saved, 144,000. Those who get saved because of their testimony. The, the part of the nation that is able to make it to Petra to find safety. And you'll have the tribulation saints. You'll have the ones who are saved during that time period. Who will be losing their lives for the sake of the gospel. Not, not having the freedom that we have now. But it's going to be a horrific time. And even in that, and, and to me, and I, I, just as I was reading this before I came up this morning, it almost looks to me like the beginning of the end for the Antichrist, he starts to maybe feel things unravel a little bit. Because if this is speaking, uh, verse 23, and, and the following, couple following after there, uh, I think down to 26, if that's speaking of that last three and a half years, He's not the only one on earth claiming to be Christ. He's not the only one. These, there, there are going to be some people who are brave enough to stand up and say, you know what? I'm the Christ. I'm not in Jerusalem. That dude in Jerusalem's false, false God. Follow me. Now, this could be speaking of, of our time now. We could certainly run down a list of people in the last 20 years who have claimed to be or are still claiming to be Christ. They're all over the earth. And people make these pilgrimages to Siberia, to Africa, to all kinds of places to see these men. And if you've ever seen pictures of them, they look like they're gone, most of them. I don't think the, anti the Antichrist is going to, you know, look like he's in some kind of state of, I don't know, I don't know what even, what even to, like, you know, listen, my friends in my past that I've seen look like that were on drugs. These guys look like they're high. They're, they're just, their minds are gone. I don't think the Antichrist will look like that. He will have it together. He will look good. He will speak good. His eyes will be clear. It's not like that. But anyhow, I'm, I'm like way off here. If anyone says you look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders, even to deceive, if possible, even the elect. All right. The good news in there is that if it's possible, there's many who are going to, Show signs and wonders. Many false prophets, false Christ, false saviors are going to show up. They're going to do signs and wonders. He doesn't even say those are fake. They're going to be able to do miraculous things. That's why I have a problem with if, if you, there are, there are people, there are churches that if you want to preach, signs and wonders better be coming with you. Or we're not listening to you. And that's a real deal, man. That's a real thing. If you don't have miracles following you, then they will not listen to you. And they're, 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 uh, their reasoning for that is, well, Jesus did miracles. And the apostles did miracles. And they did these things to be able to give validity to their word. But... Listen, when you study the Gospels, you find often Jesus could have a great big, huge crowd healing all kinds of people. And when he began to speak, they went away. They start falling away. Because it's not truth they're looking for. They're looking for a drive-through religion. 
you know. Even on even on our microwaves, we don't even like to punch in a full time, man. You just hit the start button three times and your coffee will warm up for a, a minute and a half. You don't even have to know how to push one, three, zero, start. You just push the start button, boop, 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 and I walk away, I come back, and my coffee's ready. If it's, you know, from the night before. That's what we want. We don't want to commit. We don't want to put effort into. We don't we don't want to hear truth. We don't want to hear reason. We want what we need taken care of right now. And I'll come back when I need something else. We want supernatural. We want hype. We want all of this. We are, and, and I don't know, honestly, guys, if this is everywhere in the world or this is just an American thing. Or just a civilized world thing, if that's what you want to call it. We're not all that civilized when you see what we do to each other. But when we got to have the flash and the bang, when we have to have the miracles, you have to have people getting up out of wheelchairs, you have to have people throwing their crutches across the room, you, whatever, or you're not going to listen to the guy. Then I think you fall into the same category as the Pharisees that Jesus that, that came to Jesus and said, show us a sign. If you're really the Christ, show us a sign. You have been walking among thousands of people at times being healed and you want a sign. We're never satisfied. If the story of Noah's Ark was true, they would find the Ark. Well, there are people who believe they have. I've seen some pictures. Pretty convincing, actually. But if we could unbury that thing in the ice off the top of the mountain or, or know for sure that the one that's in the valley, the rock formation that we think might be the ark. If we could absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, establish that one of those two places is really the ark, they still wouldn't believe. And many of us, I know I would be one, if I had the money, would make, spend a lot of money, make a pilgrimage, go out and see the thing. We'd forget about Kentucky and we'd, we'd head to Turkey. You want to see what the ark looks like? Our best guess, go down there. It's all intact. It's not a rock formation. You know, Ken Ham's done a great job with it. Go down and look at that. And, and, and be thankful to God that somebody was, was able to do that that god provided for that thing to be built that it's a, a born again believer who that i mean it's awesome go look at that and forget about the mountains of ararat i mean it'd be great i would love it if they would find it but how many of you know that in the last couple of weeks they in jerusalem they found a seal of hezekiah and another one of Isaiah, who was the main prophet of his time in Jerusalem. And we do, Israel's coughing up stuff about the Bible all the time. All the time. Don't get hung up on signs and wonders. They, there's lying signs and wonders. And this is not the only place the Bible warns about it. The Antichrist himself will call, come with all kinds of lying signs and wonders. And people will go for that. It says false Christ, false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the elect. Listen, if, you, if, if you're not hung up on that, if that's not your big deal. If really what you love is the word of God and wanting to know him. And, and we believe in miracles. I don't want to shortchange that. We've seen a number of them even in our small church. They may be spread out over the years, but we've seen a number. So I, I, don't, I don't want to discredit that at all. But the word of God, it's got to line up with that. This has got to take precedence in our life. This has got to take precedence in our ministry because this is what brings the freedom to people. Because if they get healed and they can get up out of a wheelchair, but they don't have 
Christ, they don't have anything. They're still lost. If they didn't know the forgiveness of sins, it doesn't matter if they know how to speak. It doesn't matter if they know how to see. If they have not received the salvation that opens up their eyes in their spirit and gives them ability to comprehend the grace of God and the, the desire to grab a hold of that, then they are still blind. They are still dumb. They're still deaf. But now they don't know it. But if you can see all of this and you can see through it, and listen, many can see through it and are still lost. The problem is they don't want to lump all of us into the whole fiasco that's going on out there and say, well, none of you are any good. And that's when it falls to us to live in a, in a righteous life. To put on the righteousness of Christ, to go out into this world, to live right before God in front of everybody to see. If you understand how desperate you were to find Jesus, if you remember that, if you understand how far gone you were and what he has done to release you from your sin, that is the sign. That is the wonder. To be able to live in freedom, to be able to live in forgiveness, that's amazing because nobody else in all of history has been able to bring that to us but jesus christ himself that's it it's why he can say i am the only way i am the only truth and i am the only way to life and i'm the only way to the father i am it period no other way because he is the only one who has ever brought to us the grace of God and said, here, I'm going to give you a choice. My grace, which brings mercy and forgiveness and love, or you can hang on to your judgment. You can hang on to your sin. You can live your life now the way you want to live, but judgment's coming. I paid for your sin. I paid your debt, or you can try to pay it on your own, and you're not going to be able to. Don't go after him. Don't go out. Even in that last days, in that last seven year period, when more come out and more convincing signs and wonders are there, don't chase after him. He's not in the desert. He's not in the inner room. He's not in some secret location in Brooklyn, New York. Which is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. He says in verse 28 and 27, there will be no doubt when I come back in anybody's mind. He says, for as lightning comes from the, uh, from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagle will gather together. And I think that's a reference to Armageddon. This is a reference to when he really does come back. In Revelation 19, he describes this. He's going to, after the, the finishing up of the marriage supper of the Lamb, he's going to get on his white horse. In verse 11 of chapter 19, says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True and righteous, Righteousness, or in righteousness, he judges the, and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on, on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, with it, uh, that with it 
He should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine presses of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather together for the supper of the great of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on the th- who sit on them, and the flesh of all peoples, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast of the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword with which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. There's not going to be any doubt where he's at. You won't be able to go past that place. In Armageddon, we've talked about this before, the Valley of Megiddo, that is a very long valley. That is a wide valley. That is a deep, deep place. And in another place, it says that it will be filled with blood to the horse's bridle. All the armies of the nations gather together to make war. And even though Jesus comes with his army, with us, even though all of heaven empties out and comes with him, we don't do anything. We show up and we watch. You have this great show of force, but then with a word, it's done. You won't, there there will be no mistaking that he is here. He goes on with verse 29, says, After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give uh, its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and when all the tribes of the earth will mourn uh, and they, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with great, a, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the win, uh, four winds uh, from one end of, the, of heaven to the other. There will be no mistaking that he's coming. After the tribulation, after that seven years is done, you go back up to verse 21 that talks about that time. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, and he's, he, he defines 27 and 28 a little more. Right before, right before the judgment is done, right before the war is fought, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. You guys, the entire universe is going to shake. We've talked about the increase in frequency and the increase in severity of, of earthquakes now. And we mentioned there's some, there are some complete earth-shaking earthquakes that happened in the book of Revelation in that seven-year period. But now all of the universe is going to be rocked at the coming of Jesus. All of the universe. There will be no other light it, at least that's how I'm reading this. Not from the sun, not from the stars, not from the moon. No other light except for him. There have been all kinds of, what is the sign that, that he talks about? The sign of the coming of the Son of Man. Some have preached in the past that it will, it, it'll be a cross that will be burning, that will be heading toward the earth. Eh, not very likely to me, but... I think it's just going to be him in all of his glory. What we just saw in Revelation 19. 
the glorified Christ coming, lit up. Like you see in the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Like you see in Ezekiel. Bright. The one who was the light, the one who created the light. John said he's the light of everyone coming into the world. Not only is he going to be spiritually the light that comes into every, in, to, or is part of every man that comes in the world, not, not only is he that light that draws and calls all the men that gives them the ability to, and the desire to want to find their creator, but he is the one who said in the beginning, or when it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. Boom. And he did it. And it's created before the sun. It's created before the moon. It's created before the stars. Think about it this way. I hope I'm not wrong, but those things, the sun, the moon, the stars, were not created to give light. They're created to contain the light that God had created first. To bear the light for us. It didn't take millions of light years for some star, the light for some star to reach us. When he said, let there be light, and then he created the, the stars and the planets and all that, is there. It's just there. The light was already here. And when he said so, it went and it made that light beam from a star that's millions and billions of light years away, it made that beam was there right now, faster than the speed of light. We want to confine God, God by, by science. This is ridiculous. Almighty God, he's almighty God or isn't he? It's a little frustrating to me that well-spoken Christians want to want to take... <laughs> And, and I can agree with them on every other thing, but every once in a while, they want to take a miracle. They want to take a part of creation. And they want so bad to be able to throw it back in the face of the evolutionists that they come up with their own sometimes ridiculous ways that God made something. He spoke it. It was done as soon as he said. The processes came after to maintain what he created. He didn't develop the processes to make it happen. If that's true, then we have to consider evolution as a process that brought everything in. But I don't believe that. The Bible says he said, let this happen, and it happened. He took a pile of dirt, breathed on it, and said, there's a man. With a word, he's going to slay so many people in a valley. With a word. How do, we, how do we get to this point where we think we're doing God a favor by coming up with some kind of scientific process and saying, well, this is how God did it. And I, and I don't even have necessarily the problem with the processes all the time. Evolution I have a problem with, but others I don't. It's just realizing that the processes are there that God put in place to maintain what he created, not to create. Anyways, see, doesn't take much for me to get off of this, does it? All right, so the brightness, the sun, the moon, the stars, they all go out. It is his glory, the Shekinah glory of God coming to earth that they're going to see. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Not great glory, great glory. I mean, great glory will be coming too, but not, you know, not, not that. He doesn't get a special seat. 
I have to. You know, every other Calvary Chapel pastor has to hit that joke. Every single one that teaches <laughs> that verse hits that joke. So I had to. Anyways, power and great glory. And it's going to cause them to mourn. Just seeing him come. And yet, they're still going to be ready to go to battle with him. I don't get it. And he will send his angels with great, uh, with a great sound of, of a trumpet, and they will gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. All right, so now I don't believe that this is the church that he's gathering together as the elect because we're with him. We read Revelation 19, we're with him. I think this is the nation of Israel being gathered back together. We're, we're still in a Jewish context here. That is the, the, the remnant of Israel and even those who didn't make it to Petra but are all over the world in hiding, they, he brings them back. Because he's going to establish his rule and his reign there in Israel for a thousand years. If you keep reading in Revelation through 19 through 20, you find out that that's what happens. It says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. Right? And, and again, this is... This is one of those phrases that caused me to say, don't get emotional about this. Understand it. Don't feel like you know. No, you can know. It's possible to know exactly what God is saying and what he, what he wants you to know. All right? He wants you to learn. He doesn't want you to go through life just feeling like this is okay and feeling like that might be okay. You can have... Listen, if, if, if our salvation is sure, then we can know God. We can know his word. We can understand his word. John said in 1 John, we don't need a teacher because we have the anointing, speaking of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, to give you an understanding of God's word. So if it's confusing, pray. Ask him to show you. Ask him to show you. And spend more time with just the Bible and flipping back and forth in the Bible than you do with commentaries and everything else. Concordances are great. Commentaries, not always so much. And when sometimes you'll find out you get to a hard passage in the Bible and you can't find a commentary that's willing to comment on it. So... All right, so verse 32, learn this, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches are ready, or when its branches are already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. All right, so the fig tree. And we know that at times the fig tree is a reference to Israel. So many, including myself, have looked at this and said, you know what? You see Israel uh, established. A tree doesn't put forth tender shoots. It doesn't put forth leaves unless it's established. Right? So you, you see the nation of Israel established. You see it beginning to to bloom and to bud and to blossom. And we talked about some of their economy in the last couple of weeks and how they are, in spite of everything that goes on around them and in spite of all the efforts to try to stifle them and snuff them out, they are feeding the world in some places. They are developing things that, you know, from my understanding, your little USB plug-in thing, they developed that. Voicemail, I think they developed the, develop that. That some of the things you depend on on a daily basis, Jewish technology. We talked about all of that. And certainly you can, it doesn't take a lot to make this say, 
that when you see Israel back in the land, when you see them functioning as a sovereign nation, which, I mean, you know, we just moved our embassy there. We're kind of on board with Israel. I'm really liking our policy toward Israel right now in this nation like it has never, ever been before. I don't care who your favorite president is. This one right now, if you don't like anything else about him, you should love this about him. Because the Bible is very clear. Those who bless Israel, I will bless. Those who curse Israel, I will curse. Very clear. If we have anything left good in this nation, this is it right now. You know, it was one thing to pull out of the Human Rights Committee in the UN and say it's ridiculous and it's a farce to be on a committee that has some of the biggest human rights violators in the world sitting on the committee. That's one thing to say that. But then to full out and address both Pompeo and Haley say this pertains and is inspired mostly by the way they treat Israel. And to stand up for Israel when they when they made the announcement we were pulling out. I love that about us right now. Now, will we always be there? I don't know. Will it be our demise? Could be. I'd rather go down because we love Israel than go down because we hate Israel. Because one is just being taken out by men. The other one's being taken out by God. And I don't want to do that. But anyways, they're my political rant for the week. <laughs> so people will look at this. And say, all right, so we've seen Israel in the land. So that generation that sees Israel reestablished in the land will not pass away until they see these things happen. In fact, um, Billy Graham's daughter just made a, a speech very similar to that recently. Excited that it happened in her lifetime. And since she's part of that generation, she is really looking forward to the Lord coming back in her lifetime, unless the Lord takes her sooner, but in her lifetime, because she saw it happen. But there's another way to look at this. Because he's saying, and if you go into Mark, he says, the fig tree and all the other trees, Mark records that do the same thing. And he's saying, when you see a tree with its tender shoots coming out, its new branches coming out, and you see the leaves come out, what does it say here? You know that summer is near. You know. You know the time of year. This is, we haven't in a couple of years, but in the years past, we've made maple syrup out of our maple trees in our, in our yard. You start end of February, you're pulling sap, you know, and uh, you stop pulling sap when you see the buds for the leaves start to appear. Because then they said the sap starts to get bitter. You don't boil it anymore. You just, you pull your taps and you're done. You know the seasons. You know the times. He could have eat just as easily said when you see the leaves turn colors and fall off the trees, you know winter's coming. So he says, when, when you see the buds come forth, when you see the leaves come out, you know summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. What do you start getting ready for when you see the trees, the leaves come out? We start getting ready for summer. We start looking forward to maybe going to the beach. If you're going to go to the, ble to the beach, if you're a farmer, you start thinking, all right, it's getting ready time to plant. <clears throat> Or maybe you're thinking, uh, I'm already behind the plant. I should have had it in there before the leaves came out. I don't know. But, you know, you know. You know that some of your animals, if you have animals, the animals are going to be giving birth now if they hadn't already started. You know, you, you know certain things are You look forward to summer. You know it's starting to get Maybe you're like me. <sighs> this means the heat is coming. It's going to get humid. We live in a swamp. We We just... Uh, really, that's what Michigan is. When, when that little town that I live in can, can boast of 36 lakes and five miles, we live in a swamp. <laughs> and, 
and and I'm thinking so for me because it's just how I am with the heat. I like I like the cold. I like I'm sorry. I like the cool nights of, of fall and spring. I like I like the cold. I like the snow because there's no mosquitoes. I hate mosquitoes. They don't weird me out or anything. I just you know they annoy me. Black flies. I've started walking because it's summer. It's nice out, right? As I need to get in a little bit of shape. I started walking every morning. Black flies. Because I live near lakes. So you get down around the lake, get down around the wetlands because I don't li- live near the open water. I live near the swampy end of the lake. Black flies burrowing into your hair trying to get down. And, you know, it's annoying. You know in the winter time, you could just put more clothes on, more blankets on, and get warm. There's only so far you can go in the summer to get cool. It's it's you know the air conditioning goes out and you're done. The heater goes out, you light a fire. You know it just it's me. I know it's me. But there are good things we look forward to, right? We look forward to the flowers coming out. We look forward to seeing the small animals, the ones that are newborn, most of them. We, we, we look forward for that kind of thing. The, the fresh getting out in the air, cause especially those of you who stay shut up all winter, you, you, when the leaves are coming out, it's time for me to start going outside, you know, spending more time outside. We get out in the sunlight, we get the vitamin D, and we start feeling better about ourselves and, and all that. He's saying here, you know the time. So when you see all of these things I'm talking about, know that the time is near even at the door. You know the times. You know the seasons. He held Israel just a few chapters ago. Not even. Just a chapter before this. Held Israel responsible for not knowing that he was the Messiah standing in front of them. Not taking into account Zechariah's prophecy of, of him coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. Not taking into account the prophecies of Daniel. Or that the people that they wanted him to tell to be quiet were saying the very words that were prophesied they would say. And because of that, he said, listen, you, this is, destruction is coming, even to the temple. Not one stone left upon another. And we know we went over this, 70 AD it happened. I think that you have the kings from the east that come at his birth when he's young. They come because they, they're following a sign. Why do they know there's a sign? Well, if you go back to Daniel's time, Daniel is put in charge of those people in the east. We don't have anything written to say that, that he gave them a prophecy or a sign to look for. But how else would they know to look for a sign and know that that sign was the, the birth of the king of Israel? Unless God had showed him somehow. My guess is through Daniel. I could be wrong, and he'll correct me when I'm there if I am, I guess. But Paul would tell the Thessalonican church, you are, he's coming like a thief in a knife. Yeah, a thief in a knife. Thief in a night. Thief with a knife. Sword, more like. But anyways, he's coming like a thief in the night. But this day shouldn't overtake you like that. Because you're not children of the night. You are children of the light, the children of the day. You should know the sign of his coming. Any born-again believer should know. Listen, the Thessalonican church, and people say, well, you can't, you know, you can't tell new believers all this stuff right up front. It's too much for them to take in. Paul was in Thessalonica for three weeks. And in his letter, he said, when I was with you, I told you these things. A brand new church that he established. He explained, not only did he explain salvation and grace and the mercy of God, but he explained the prophecies 
of the scriptures, which would be the Old Testament in his time, and how they pertain to the time that was coming still ahead. So they knew that those who had got, died and gone before them didn't miss Jesus. But then he told them, he reminded them of the resurrection that he had told them about. And that the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them and meet him in the air. And we're going to get to that in verse 30, starting with verse 36. We might get that today. But Jesus is saying here, when you see all of these things start to take place, that generation is not going to pass away. This is why it's so very important to know prophecy right now. Because if you don't know, if you've never looked through Ezekiel, if you've never chased down these prophecies, if you have never seen that it was, it was imperative that Israel be back in the land, that that would be the thing that would get this snowball rolling. And if you have never seen in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that the nations were going to gather against them, specific nations, and come and attack from the north, and that God would defend Israel himself. And, and 10, 15 years ago, that was impossible. These nations weren't allied with one another. Thank as little as 20 years ago, Israel and, 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 and uh, Turkey were allies. 30, 40 years, well, 70s anyways, Israel and Iran were allies. Now they are sworn enemies like they have never been allies. And they're aligned with Russia who really can't stand either one of them. And their economies are failing. And we saw last week, God said, I'm going to put a hook in your mouth and I'm going to pull you down. Their economies are failing. All three of those countries especially. They have plenty of reason to want to invade and take a spoil. Israel has oil. Israel has natural gas. Israel has technology. Israel has agriculture. More established and better than all of those nations that are coming to attack. When we see those signs, when we see the increase in frequency and intensity of earthquakes and natural disasters, which we do. I've, I've stayed on that little earthquake alert thing that I told you I found a couple weeks ago. And it's and this guy, he predicts earthquakes like weathermen actually better than weathermen predict the weather. He's got it all kind of mapped out. And if it happens here, then interesting he made a comment the other day it took him seven years to get it all traced out and figured out so that he can predict with the accuracy that he does now and, he, and he's saying listen and he's he points to certain areas he said well this is a mining community over here where these are happening oh this is a military base over here might have been an explosion we used to live not very far from the boron mine out in Southern California. He hit that the other day. And that there were earthquakes in the area caused by the explosions are big enough to cause some earthquakes. With all the volcanoes, 80 some active volcanoes. We have volcanoes on this earth right now that have been duds for, for hundreds, some thousands of years have not been active at all. And all of a sudden, they're all waking up at the same time. And as their magma chambers empty out, things are moving and shaking and collapsing. You guys, I told, in fact, I think, I think it was last week, I mentioned, maybe the week before, um, this new word that I hear from all the prophecy people. And I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or not, but they're using the words converge or convergence. They'll say, when you look at this is all happening and then this is converging on that and then that's converging on this and then, and all it is is all that is what Jesus said right here. When you see this happen, 
when you see all of these things, know that it's near, even at the door. It's near, guys. He's going to talk about a time and not knowing the day or the hour. In fact, in verse 36, and we'll end with that, I think. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even, it, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as, it, as, but as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Nobody knows the day or the hour. How about that? Noah didn't know the day or the hour. God just said, I'm coming. Nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. So people will say, well, do you think the Antichrist is alive now? I think there is an Antichrist, the one who could take that place. I think he's alive right now. I think Satan has had one. I made this, this, this statement last week, I think. He's had one in every generation because he also does not know the day or the hour. So there has always been somebody alive ready to take that place when it needed to happen. Nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven. So does that mean nobody knows the day or the hour that he comes back, that he touches down on the Mount of Olives and splits that in half? Right now we don't know that day or hour. But when that seven-year deal is signed in, or put in enforcement by the Antichrist with Israel, the clock starts ticking. The Bible is very clear about that. It's called time and times and half a time. It's called by the number of days. It's called by the number of months. It's called by the number of years. That's very specific. Once that starts ticking, they'll know the day or the hour for that. But what is there that nobody knows the day or the hour of? The rapture of the church. We don't know the day or the hour. That's why we live as though it could happen at any moment because we want to be right when he comes. We don't want to be like the little kid who has mom come home a half an hour early from work and he hasn't done any of his stuff. Talked about this with the kids from at, at the youth group Friday night. You see all of them kind of laughing and chuckling because every last one of them has been caught. Just like me. Mom leaves a list. I can do this and eh, that many minutes. I could get that in about a half an hour. No problem. She's going to be gone about two and a half hours. So I got two hours to goof off. The last half an hour, I'll, I'll bust it out. And I said, and then how many of you panic when you look up and you realize it's been two hours and 15 minutes? And all of a sudden, what was supposed to get done, you can't get done before mom gets home. But if you had done it before, you'd have had two hours to mess around anyways. All right. And we all have to learn that lesson. And listen, that is a lesson we need to apply to our, the way we live our lives now. We do not want to guess at the day or the hour that Jesus is coming. We're going to goof off. We're going to live our lives the way we want to live. You hear people say this all the time. When I see this sign or when I see that sign, then. If I see the church leave, then I know I got seven more years left. Then I'll give my life to the Lord. Really? Cause you're going to lose your head when you won't take that mark, man, death is coming. You won't do it now and live. You're going to, you're going to do it then and die. He says in verse 35, and let's just back up here to this. I'm going to finish that up. We'll, we'll hit the rapture full on next week. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. This is not the only place in the Bible that says that.
And again, you guys, I have heard over and over again, the word of God is be, it, it is being attacked from beginning to end. There are those who want to just cut holes through the whole thing and just pick and choose and, and live however they want to. There are those who want to disregard Genesis and want to disregard Revelation, which those two books take you into the rest of the Bible anyways. But they want to take out the beginning. They want to take out the end. That's ridiculous. He says, my words will by no means pass away. In Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 152, concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Matthew 5, 18, which we months ago went through this, says, For as surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. 1 Peter 1, 25, But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. And he says here, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Not only must you believe in this, you guys, we can believe in this. It has been established. By going back over the prophecies, we have seen how God has established his word. By going over the prophecies that have been fulfilled, we have seen how he has kept his word. It is no small thing to say that his words are established in heaven. Period. Man can do whatever they want to this Bible, to this book. It will change nothing. God's word has been spoken by him. It has been spoken by the Holy Spirit in the hearts of men and caused them to, to write it down. It has been put in the heart of men to preserve it. Again, by the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit to preserve it for generation to generation to generation. We have more copies of manuscripts, of parts and portions and full books than any other ancient writing in existence. By far more, so we know it's accurate. We also know that just from the writings of the early church fathers, we can reconstruct the entirety of the Bible except for like 11 verses that don't, uh, don't affect doctrine at all. I can't remember if it's just the New Testament or if it's the entire Bible. I think it's the entire Bible, but it might be just the New Testament. Because when they wrote their sermons out, they wrote the sections of the scriptures that they were preaching on in their sermons. We can go back through their sermons. Everything we have, we can reconstruct the Bible, even if we lost all the manuscripts. On top of that, God has said to, to others, and David had testified of this himself, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I would not sin against you. It is important, you guys, to take this in. It washes us in Ephesians chapter 5. It makes us clean. The laver in the tabernacle was symbolic of God's word. It's made out of bronze, which speaks of just, uh, justice and judgment. But it was filled with water. And the priests cleansed themselves as they did their work in the temple, in that laver, in that giant bowl. It is what we do. It is where we go. It's what feeds us. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is important. Protect it. Don't let anybody get away with minimizing God's word. Listen, I don't mean to be, you know, facetious or to be mean spirited or anything of that nature, but you guys, when somebody is going to minimize God's word in your presence, please, with all love and compassion, tell them you can't do that. 
They want to establish their, their ministry on music. They can't do that. It's not music alone. They want to establish their ministry on, or who they follow, on miracles and signs and wonders. They can't do that. Be brave enough to say something. They need to know God's word. This is what keeps us from sin. This is what brings us to repentance. It is his word that brings healing. It is his word that brings freedom. It is his word that created everything. It is his word that will bring everything to an end. It is his word that will bring a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus himself by John is called the word. To reject it, to minimize it, is to reject and minimize Jesus. To, and, and I mean by the entirety of the whole thing. He loved us enough to tell us the end from the beginning, he said. I've told you these things so that when they begin to happen, you'll know. I told you ahead of time. We just read that earlier. And we read it today, but it's it's in here. In this chapter. And here he says, my words, my words won't pass away. After this discourse, he's going to go into an upper room with his disciples and he's going to establish a communion that we that we participate in and he says to them don't forget me he loved us enough to give us this he loved us enough to give us the warnings but most of all he loved us enough to die for our sins He said he would, and he did. We've seen over and over again in Matthew, I'm going to go, I'm going to die, I have to. But I'm going to come back. He did that. He, he's fulfilling his word, you guys, his promises to us. I'm going to close with this and it's something I've become a habit of with me I, I don't care if everybody in this building is saved somebody might listen to this later on somebody might be watching right now I don't know but the Bible tells us that if we will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that, he ra that God raised him from the dead will be saved that there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. All of us have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God, but he made that way. So yes, you have to admit that you need a savior. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to confess with your mouth. You have to believe in your heart. And you'll be saved. Understand the times that we live in. Understand his word. Understand that it is near even at the door. Listen, all through his teaching, all through Matthew, and even when we went through Luke, when he sent out the disciples, he would tell them, you tell them the kingdom of God is, is near you. He himself would say that to the crowds. We saw. The message hasn't changed. It's maybe a little more defined now. The kingdom of God is near even at the door. If you follow him, follow him with your whole heart. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't wait for some sign. Don't wait for some miracle. You have it now. You have the word of God spoken to you right now. He loves you. 
He wants to set you free from your sin. He wants to spend all of eternity with you. And he was willingly paid the price, not just the cross, not just the beatings, but the wrath of God for three hours while he was on the cross. So that he could say at the end of that, it is finished. To tell us die means paid in full. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that everybody hearing this today would hear your voice and not mine. Calling to them, speaking to their hearts, Lord. Lord, that it would have put in their heart today a desire to know you. Lord, thank you for giving us the understanding to know your word, to know the time that we live in. Lord, there are many distractions and fears and worries and anxieties of this world that will distract us from what we know and maybe even sometimes cause us to doubt. But Lord, it's so good to know that if we know your word, we will not be deceived. That we will overcome our doubts because we know you. We know what we believe. Because you have spoken it, you have maintained it, you have brought it to us, and it has given us life. There is no place else for us to go. Lord, if there is anybody listening at this moment today who needs you, Lord, I pray that they would give their heart to you today. that they would confess Jesus as Lord, that they would seek the forgiveness of their sins and have a relationship with you the rest of their days and on into eternity. And that they would become a great witness for you wherever they are. In Jesus' name, amen.